morning. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel this morning on the sixth Sunday of Easter. Uh, this is a Sunday in which we traditionally focus on prayer. Uh, what does prayer have to do with Easter? Uh, well, in short, if it wasn't for the resurrection, we'd have no reason to approach God. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, we'd still be dead in our sins. And when we approach God, we could do it in no way except for in fear. Because Christ rose from the dead, we know that our sins have been forgiven. We know that when we approach God, we approach God, a God who loves us and a God who forgives us. And so he invites us today to approach him confidently, trusting in his forgiveness. We join in prayer. O Lord God, our blessed Heavenly Father, we come before you this day with joy. You are a merciful God, full of compassion and abounding in mercy and truth. You tenderly invite us to come into your presence and receive your grace and forgiveness. We come here today to confess our sins, desiring to be blessed by your forgiving hand. May our worship be pleasing in your sight, for Christ's sake. Amen. Continue with our opening hymn, hymn 19, verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. 19, 1 through 3, and verse 6. If you drive a silver mercury sable, your lights are flashing on your vehicle. Yeah, the alarm goes off every now and then. I never know what it's off. Okay. Thank you.
guys. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love Him and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from conception. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. We read responsibly the intro. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture reading. <laughs> our Old Testament reading for this morning comes from Hosea chapter 14, we read verses 5 through 9. Hosea was a prophet that was sent to a very rebellious nation of Israel, and he was sent in order to call the people to repentance. In our text this morning, God promises the people that if they turn to him in repentance, in prayer, he will answer them with forgiveness, and he will continue to bless them. We read from Hosea 14. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out, 
His beauty shall be like the olive, and his fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. So far, God's holy word. Our gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. Very familiar section of scripture in which God invites us to pray to him. And he gives us certain comforts in this section. He says, when we, as sinful parents, give good things to our children, how much more, then, will God, who is perfect, give to his children, us, whom he loves perfectly? We can approach God in complete confidence, knowing that he does love us, and that he does promise to answer our prayers. We read from Matthew chapter 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven good, good, give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it.
Let us pray. Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning comes from 1 John chapter 5. We read verses 11 through 15. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. So far, God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, in Booker T. Washington's book, Up From Slavery, Mr. Washington relates a encounter he had with a former slave from Virginia. This man had worked out an agreement with his master that said that if he worked to pay off or pay for his freedom, he could work wherever he wanted to, as long as he kept sending the yearly payments. Yeah. Now this slave, the, the place he had heard of with the, best, with the best wages was in Ohio. So he went to Ohio and worked. And every year he sent payments to his master in Virginia. Now it just so happened that when this agreement was made, this was only about two to three years before the Emancipation Proclamation took place. And of course, once that happened, this man was freed. The government had ensured his freedom. But he still owed his master about $300. Now obviously he the man wasn't still his master, nor did he actually owe anything because his, his freedom was guaranteed by the government. Nevertheless, the man decided to keep working. He worked until he had made every single last dollar with interest, and he went to Virginia, and he placed it into his former master's hand. Booker T. Washington asked this man why he did that. It was unnecessary. The man replied that he'd given his word to his master, and he wouldn't be able to enjoy his freedom until he had fulfilled his promise. Such a promise like that. One that is kept, even when you don't expect it to be. It's very rare. As sinful humans, we constantly make promises that we don't intend to keep, or promises that we just don't follow through on. How often do we make appointments and plans with friends, only later to just come up with an excuse and cancel them? actually following through with something that we promise. It does happen, but it seems like it happens far less than the promises that we make and don't follow through with. If you think back to promises that have been made to you, promises that have been broken, it may seem at times when someone tells you some, that they'll do something for you, it seems like a 50-50 proposition at best. It could happen. It probably won't because of the simple way in which we give and receive promises, we're conditioned to hear God's promises and be in doubt over whether or not he's actually going to follow through. There's a number of places we can look in, in God's word for his promises. They're all over the place. This morning, I want to draw your attention to our pre-service meditation. If you open up your bulletin to Psalm 34, that's at the top of the page. I couldn't fit all of the psalm, but I fit as many of the promises as I could. Starting with verse 7, God's promise to us. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Verse 10, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. 17, when the righteous cry for, for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. And then yet another promise in verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Do these sound like 50-50 propositions to you? Does it sound like God is making an empty promise to you that he plans on breaking? No, he's not. Although when we read his promises, we still can't help but be in doubt 
and wonder, does God really mean that promise for me? Has God forgotten about me? It's the devil's number one goal to get you to doubt Jesus' promises to you. And his promises are abundant. He promises to love you. He promises that he has forgiven your sins on the cross. And how hard the devil works to try to make you to doubt that or to forget those facts. John speaks in this text about God coming to us with his testimony. It's a legal term. Someone stepping forward and presenting evidence. And it's hard to not picture the devil stepping forward on the opposite side and presenting his own testimony, his own evidence. And his evidence is abundant. He points to you and your, your tremendous amount of sin and your constant unfaithfulness to the Lord. He points to the world around us and the, the really terrible things that happen. He points to the unexpected tragedies that happens in our lives. And to conclude his arguments, he says, does it look like there's a God who loves you? Does it look like God is really in control or that he cares about you? Do you really think that God forgives you for your sins? He makes a compelling argument. And at times, we are tempted to be swayed by our adversary's testimony. In these times, it's good for us to turn to the Lord's word and to hear what he says instead. Because God's testimony instills confidence. Confidence, for, confidence in our eternal life and confidence for our prayer life. Starting in verse 11. John writes, and this is the testimony. So what John's about to present, what follows, is the substance of God's testimony. And when it comes to what God thinks, or what God says about you, or how God forgives you, this is the only place to look. Because only God knows, and only God will tell us the truth. Here's the substance of his testimony. God gave us eternal life. This life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. The fears that the devil seeks to plant in us, fears that God doesn't really love us, fears that God really doesn't forgive our sins, fears that God doesn't care for us, God answers those right here with a few simple phrases that anyone can understand. He says, God has given us eternal life, and he who has the Son has life. We break those down with a few questions. Who is it that does this? It's the first word, God. It's not us. It comes from God alone. How, how do people get it? It says that God gives it to us. In other words, it's a gift, something he just simply gives away. What is the gift? It's identified as life. Eternal life, both for body and soul in heaven. And then who gets the gift? He says, you do. You who have the Son. You who believe in Jesus as your Savior. The gift of eternal life belongs to you. It's a very simple message. It's a certain promise. It's not a 50-50 proposition. And we know this promise has more than just a chance of fulfillment. Because Jesus has already fulfilled it. When he rose from the dead on Easter morning, he accomplished our eternal life. He tells us in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Turn that into the positive, And he's saying, you have life through me. You can approach God, your Father, confidently through Jesus. That's his guarantee to you. Now for his testimony in answer to the devil's accusations, God our Father points to his Son. He says, you don't think I love you? Look at my Son that I gave in your place. You don't think I've forgiven your sins? Look at my Son and how I raised him from the dead, guaranteeing that his death was enough to pay for even your worst sins. Yes, the Lord points to his Son says, here is the proof that when you die, you will live. 
As Jesus rose from the dead, you too will rise. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. This testimony is given to us so that we know these facts are certain for us. In fact, John goes on to describe this knowledge as being uh, as, as confidence. He says we can have confidence in these facts. Now, confidence is something that we're kind of wary of at times. After all, we know that overconfidence can be a bad thing. We all have run into overconfident people, and it just kind of slaps you in the face right when, right when you start talking to them. Overconfidence has a way of presenting itself as, as smugness or arrogance or a feeling of superiority. And so we're taught growing up, rather than being overconfident, be humble. Because if you're overconfident, you're going to create a lot of enemies in your life. As Christians, for these reasons, we try to be humble. We try to approach everything with humility, not being confident in ourselves. After all, in the Bible, when it presents people who are overconfident, it's never in a good way. Think of the Pharisee from the Pharisee and the tax collector parable. He stuck his nose up in the air and said, Lord, thank you for making me better than other men. That's overconfidence. He was confident in himself. The end result was not good for him. And so we strive to be humble. Trying to avoid this, we willingly confess our sins to God, knowing that we have indeed sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But just as we can go overboard with confidence, we can actually go overboard with humility as well. We may do this when we're so humble that we confess our sins to God and we know that we're not worthy of his forgiveness, we're not worthy of his love, and we go a little overboard and we convince us that Maybe we're so unworthy that he actually doesn't forgive us. That he actually doesn't love us. Yes, we can go overboard in humility to the point where we slip back into uncertainty about how God thinks about us. God does not want you to be uncertain. He does not want you to live in a state of unresolved guilt. So he gives you his testimony. He says in very simple terms, God has given you eternal life. You who have the Son have life. You can trust in this. And you can't possibly go overboard in confidence as long as your confidence rests in Jesus Christ, your Savior. Yes, if we put our trust in ourselves and if we're confident in our own goodness, it's never going to turn out well. But if we put our trust in the Lord and in His testimony, we have what the Lord promises eternal life. Now, I don't like to leave voicemails when I call people, mostly because I prefer reading a text as opposed to pulling up my phone and listening to the voicemail. You know, there's some flaws when you leave voicemails. For one, you're never really sure if the people get it. You know, it used to be a lot easier. You'd walk into your house and you'd see the answering machine flashing and they'd have the the number of voicemails that were left. You just click play and walk around and do what you have to do and it would read the voicemails to you. But now when you get a voicemail because of the fickle nature of technology, sometimes you don't even see the little icon that indicates you have a voicemail and in my experience at least, sometimes you just plain miss it. So when I call someone, if they don't answer, I'll either not leave a voicemail or if it's a long message, I will leave a voicemail, but then I'll shoot them a text to let them know, hey, go check your voicemail. See, when you leave a voicemail, unless someone calls you back, you can never be certain whether or not they actually listen to it. There's just no feature that tells you that the voicemail's been opened. This same feeling about, or the same feeling of uncertainty, whether or not your message has been heard, that's the same thing the devil tries to convince you of. The second part of the devil's testimony is with regards to prayer. He says, God's not listening to your prayers. God doesn't care what you have to say. In the silent moments that follow our prayers, it's easy for us to convince ourselves of the same thing. You lay there on your bed after getting done praying, and you wonder, 
did God really hear me? Does God care about what I'm asking? Or did my, my words just sort of fall to the ground unheard by anyone? Sometimes when we pray, we don't feel any more reassurance than when we leave a voicemail. Because of the nature of our life here on earth, we don't hear an immediate response when we pray. But the next part of God's testimony from our text addresses this fear as well. He says, this is the confidence that we have toward him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. Again, he invites us to approach him with confidence, boldly approaching God with whatever we need to ask him. And he promises to hear you. He promises that if it is according to his will, he will answer it. That's the key. If it's according to God's will. It's the same thing we pray every Sunday in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. Mr. Beamer says it to me every Sunday. He says, I'll see you next Sunday if the Lord wills it. The Lord's will for our day-to-day -day lives. We can't know for certain every single aspect of it. But he does reveal certain aspects of his will in his word. One that we can be certain of for sure is found in John 6. This is the will of my Father. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. This will be done. When we pray to God in connection with this, we can be certain that God will do it. That means when you approach the Lord and ask, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Do you forgive me? In connection with his will, God answers you every single time. Yes, your sins have been forgiven. We can't hear him audibly, but we can see his testimony in his word and trust that this is certainly true for us. Well, I heard a story about a missionary in the Philippines. It's a true story. This, mission, this particular missionary was haunted by a sin that he'd been committed many years before. And he'd long since confessed his sin to God and he'd been assured of his forgiveness. But it still haunted him day after day. Now on this particular occasion, this pastor was visiting a devout member of his congregation, an elderly lady who was shut in. And in the course of their discussion, she revealed something pretty surprising to him. She said that when she dreams at night, Jesus appears and she talks to him. He was rightfully in doubt over whether or not that was the case. And so he decided to test her. He said, the next time you talk to Jesus in your dreams, ask him what sin your pastor committed when he was in seminary. The woman agreed. The next week the pastor returned and asked the woman, so did Jesus appear to you in your dreams? She said, of course. And did you ask him about my sin? Yes, I did. And the pastor asked, what did he say? He said, I don't remember. If you approach the Lord, you're not going to hear him speak back to you. You have his word and God tells us that's enough. But if you were to ask the Lord about your sins, that would be his answer. I don't remember. He tells us the very same thing in Isaiah 43, when he says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. When we pray to the Lord, we can approach with this confidence, knowing that the one to whom we're praying does indeed listen. The one to whom we're praying does indeed answer, and not only that, but he loves us, and he's taking care of our sins. The devil will do his best to try to convince you otherwise. He'll present his testimony and say, God doesn't love you. God doesn't listen to your prayers, and God certainly hasn't forgiven you. In those times, we can turn to God's word and hear his testimony that says otherwise. We can have confidence in God. Amen. Close your eyes.
and the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. seated for the sermon hymn, hymn 201.
Father, you promised to hear our prayers for the sake of your Son. Help us to accept your invitation to ask you for all good things with boldness and confidence. O oh Lord, we live in a world plagued by sinful doubt and skepticism over your word and salvation. By your Holy Spirit, open our hearts this day to pay attention to what you proclaim to us. Soothe our doubting consciences with the certain knowledge that your gospel promises are true. Creator of heaven and earth, abide with all homeless and destitute people. Despite their temporary problems, give them faith to confess that you richly and daily provide everything they need to support their bodies and lives. Stir up generosity in our hearts as we respond to your mercy by sharing your good gifts with those in need. Lord of the nations, bring order where there is instability, peace where there is strife, and safety where there is danger. Especially protect those who live and serve in dangerous areas of our cities. Give wisdom to those who you, those you place in authority over these locations as they deal with violence and danger. Through residents and authorities, make our neighborhoods safe and lead everyone to work together to promote peace and tranquility. Eternal God, sustain those who suffer in any way. Use the testimony of your word to strengthen their faith, that despite their current afflictions, they may look forward to the glory that will be revealed to them on the last day. Dear Father in heaven, we yearn for the day when we will be in your presence, able to hear and see you with our own eyes and ears. In the meantime, help us to approach you with confidence, both in prayer and in the Lord's Supper, as we're soon to receive. Reassure us with your promise that our sins are covered by the blood of your Son. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Now continue with the communion order of service, which you can find on page 17 in the front part of your worship supplement. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, same way he took the cup after supper gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink of it all of you this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me and the peace of the lord be with you always
Lord's Supper is a confession of complete unity of faith. We ask at this time only those who are members of Emmanuel Lutheran Church or of another church within the Church of the Lutheran Confession approach the table under the usher's direction. If you'd like to partake with us in the future, you may come speak with me after the service. The Savior invites, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. body and blood strengthen and preserve you in your true Christian faith into life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. body and blood strengthen and preserve you in your true Christian faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen.
life that he'll have for you. Go in his peace. Amen. Thank you. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given to death for your sins. Take and drink. This cup is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for, for the forgiveness of sins. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen and preserve you in the true Christian faith and life everlasting. Depart in peace. Thank you. 